Hey friends, I'm Scott Hanselman and I am here with partner software engineer Stephen Tobe. How are you, sir? I am doing very well. It's great to see you. Great to see you too. Um, I, I'm, I, I am confused. Uh, many years later, how many years since Await and Async came out? Uh, 12, 12. 13, uh, something along those lines. It was around 2010. I, it's so powerful. It's changed the industry. People use it outside C Sharp. It's, it's, it's a pattern now. And I feel that I understand it just enough to be dangerous. I feel like it's yeah. one of the world's greatest foot guns uh, <laughs> that I've now got directly pointed at my toes. And I do not have steel toed boots. So maybe you can help us understand what's really happening so that we might become better, better I programmers. Would, I would love to. You know, what I. One of the things that I really value is understanding how things work, having a really good mental model for how things work. And I feel like you, you, know, you don't have to understand every line of code that went into something that you're using, but the more of it you understand, the better you're able to use it and take advantage of it. And you're right, async await has been around for so long and yet still, or maybe because of that, uh, there are a lot of misconceptions about how it's actually implemented and built. So last year, maybe about a year ago, I wrote a blog post called uh, How a Async and Await Really Works in C-Sharp. Um, but it's long and it's detailed and it's walking through individual lines of code. So what I thought you and I could do would be to sort of pretend it's 10 years ago and implement a super simple version of Async and Await from the ground up. Um, and uh, along the way, kind of really see the, the bits and pieces that, that make it tick. Uh, I, I won't be particularly worried about performance, which pains me, uh, and I'll be doing things that I wouldn't do in any other context. But our goal here is just to sort of understand uh, how things fit together and get a really good mental model for it. Well, David Fowler and I recently came off of doing a like 20 or 30 part series on beginner C Sharp, and we got right up to, but did not get to async and await. And the number one most requested thing on our on our channel is is more complicated, more technical content. Would you put this at 200 level or 300 level? Like if you're beginner, intermediate, advanced, what I'd should someone like know when they join level. us here? 300 level. 300 level. Okay, so we're, gonna we're, not gonna be, we're not going to be doing anything that is fundamentally difficult, um, but some of the concepts can be a little mind bending with how things relate to one another. All right. Well, I am going to put my empathy hat on and try to be like it's 10 years ago and I've been doing this. So I'm going to be the audience and I'm going to ask awesome. questions if that's okay. Yeah, so please. let's take a look. Let's take a look at your machine. You're on Visual Studio here and we've got console.write line. Hello, Scott. Yep. Awesome. So one of the first things you realize when you start talking about async await and asynchrony is uh, asynchrony sort of breeds concurrency, right? You you start something and then it might complete immediately, it might not, but you've just launched it and you can go off and do something else at the same time. And so then when that thing completes and maybe it's going to do something else after, now you have multiple things possibly happening at the same time and you need some way to enable multiple pieces of work to all run at the same time. So at the very bottom of the stack, you have a thread pool. Uh, and since we're gonna try and build up this whole thing sort of from scratch, we should write a thread pool, write a very simple thread pool. Yeah. So to level set though on definitions, if I'm gonna say I'm gonna do things concurrently, I'm gonna do two things or more than n things at once. If I'm gonna do things asynchronously, that's not quite the same as saying I'm going to do multiple things at once. Yeah. So let's say I had a for loop here. Let's say as I equals zero, I is less than a thousand, I plus plus, and then I'm going to use a thread pool. I'm, we're now pretending that this does exist again, even though we were about to pretend that it doesn't. Uh, and I can come in here and you know, put some work inside here. Um, this, this line here is just queuing a work item. And immediately after I queue it, I can do something else. So I have queued this work asynchronously. I'm, mm. I'm launching whatever the body of this is. I'm running it asynchronously from where I currently fire and forget. Fire so and forget. It's, it's working without the join. It's, yeah. You know, yeah. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to run concurrently. If this was the UI thread of a Windows Forms application, and I wasn't using thread pool queues or work, I'm, I was instead using Control dot begin invoke. That's really just asynchronously running that work, but queuing it to run back on the, the very place that I am. So it's asynchronous invocation, but it's not necessarily concurrency. 
Got it. Where concurrency comes in is uh, the fact that this actually, you know, this piece of work here actually could end up running at the same time as this piece of work here. And so the, you can't have concurrency without asynchrony, but right. you can have asynchrony without concurrency. And then it's arguably not deterministic whether or not those two dot, dot, dots, those two ellipses, they might run at the same time, depends on your processor, depends on a million different things, depends on if you get preempted, who knows? Absolutely. And in fact, we, we can see that what, this actually leads very nicely into what I just wanted to show, which is, let's say I have this very loop here, and I'm going to say console.writeline uh, I and then uh, thread.sleep 1000. Now, you might think that when I run this, it's going to print out the numbers 0 through 1000 or 0 through 999. Um, and ideally, that's what I wanted, right? I'm, I'm queuing a bunch of work items. This machine that I'm running on is, has 12 logical cores. So the thread pool is going to have about 12 threads-ish. Uh, and so you would kind of expect to see 12 numbers printed, 0 through 11, and then 12 through 23, and so on and so on. Um, but I actually have a bug here. And if I run this, it gets to exactly what you were just talking about. Oh, this came up on the wrong monitor. You can see it's printing out all 1,000s. And it's exactly because what, of what you just said. Uh, if I sort of you know just minimize this and forget what this was doing, all I'm really doing is queuing 1,000 work items, and then I'm going off to do something else. By the time I do that, I is now 1,000. And then when these work items eventually end up running, they're just referring to that same uh, I value that was captured by this work. They're all just referring to the same variable. And so they all see it as uh, 1,000, keeps popping up on the wrong screen, uh, rather than printing out what I wanted to have it print out. Um, in fact, what's really cool is I can actually just select this code and uh, I can ask GitHub Copilot, for example, why is this printing well, out 1,000? I'm yeah. sorry, you wanted to say something? Well, while it's, while it's thinking about uh, explaining that to us, is it going to print out 1,000 of 1,000s and then this, this is will it then thousand print out 1,000 999s? This is just going to print out 1,000 of 1,000s. And that's because, the end of it. Uh, that's the end of it, yeah. Uh, why is this printing out thousands when I expected it to uh, print incrementing numbers? I love that you're using it as a rubber duck, right? Rubber ducking is this idea that I'm just going to have something on my desk that I'm going to talk to, and it's going to help me understand it. I actually have a rubber duck that I have on my monitor that's just Perfect. there to ask these questions to, but now I can do it to Copilot. Well, the really neat thing about this is it's more than a rubber duck. Is it, It's explaining the problem to me. Oh wow! Um, then it's, but then it's actually recommending a solution, which I can go and preview, mm -hmm. uh, and then just accept the change. So right. what it's done is it explain the problem, and then uh, it's basically saying rather than using this variable, which is sort of in this outer scope and is going to be reused across all of the the closures, it's I'm instead putting the thing that's being captured into the local scope. So every work item IQ will have its own copy. And if I run this now. Uh, we'll see indeed that we end up getting that behavior we were expecting where we're printing out these incrementing numbers as we go. And we're seeing it across, even though we're seeing it all in one line, uh, in one row here, we're seeing uh, them fight a little bit. Exactly. So what we want to do is here I'm using the real thread pool, but I need to do this with my own thread pool. Right? Gotcha. So we're going to go in here, we're going to write a little class called my thread pool for lack of a better name, since I'm not very creative when it comes to names. And we need that same cues or work item uh, that we just saw. So cues or work item will take an action and we need to do something with this. And one of the things I love about doing examples like this is they kind of write themselves in that I'm saying queue here. So I need a queue. Like I, I need somewhere to store this data. So I'm going to come in here and say static, read only. And there are lots of different data structures that I could use, but I'm going to use one called blocking collection. Uh, and the, the beauty of a blocking collection here is that um, you can store things into it. It's basically concurrent queue. But when I want to take something out, I will block waiting to take out uh, the thing if it's empty. And that's what I want my threads to be doing. All of my threads in my thread pool are going to be trying to take things from this queue to process it. And if there's nothing there, I want them to just wait for something to be available. So my queues or work item is just going to say work items.add and put that into the queue. Uh, and then I need a bunch of threads to do the processing. So I'll say in a static constructor for here, I'll just kick off a bunch of threads. I is less than environment. I mentioned I'm on a 12, uh, 12 logical core machine here. So I'll just have 12 of these. And each one of them is just going to kick off a thread. 
uh, and start it. Now, and interestingly, oh, sorry, go ahead, Scott. If I may, I just want to call, if you scroll up just a smidge, I want to make sure that for folks that are following along and learning, in on line six there, you said delegate, uh, and now you're using uppercase A, action. Action is a delegate, right? It's public delegate void action. So why, why, why did you went, maybe explain the juxtaposition there as you immediately and intuitively picked action? Yep. So action in .NET is the, the, you can have delegates of all shapes and sizes. They're managed function pointers, basically. Um, .NET has built in definitions of some of those for very common shapes. One of those super common shapes is just a parameterless void returning method. That's yeah. all action is. So this Do can bind to anything that is parameterless and, and void return. Cool. Uh, and so um, because we're not doing anything fancy, we're not accepting any state, we're not returning any additional arguments, I've just used action here. And if I write delegate, and I change this to my thread pool, we can see that it, it binds successfully because the compiler is able to convert this uh, anonymous method into an action. It's also right. able to do that with a lambda, which is just another way of writing the same thing. Just a good reminder to folks, an action is a delegate that has already been defined. All right, exactly. cool. Please, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. So um, I'm creating a thread here. Uh, this isn't really here or there, but interestingly, .NET sort of distinguishes two kinds of threads. It has what are called foreground threads and background threads. And the only distinction between those is when your main method exits, do you want your process to wait around for all of your threads that you created to exit as well? Foreground threads, it will wait for them. Background threads, it won't wait for them. Uh, because I don't want these threads that are sitting here in an infinite while loop to keep my process uh, alive forever. I'm just going to say is background uh, equals true. Uh, and that way, these threads don't keep my process from exiting. Now, is and that then, something that might not necessarily be intuitive to someone who came from a Unix world who is not going to think about that kind of foreground thread, background thread? And there's and also the concept of green threads and native threads in some cultures. Yeah, and frankly, it's it's not something that you frequently run into or, or that matters. But since we're sort of looking at implementing the lower level stuff here, call some of these things out along the way. Um, so these threads just sit in an infinite loop. Uh, doing something. And what are they doing? Well, they're taking the uh, next work item from work items and running it. And that's it. Now I've got my, my thread pool. And if I kick this off, uh, we can see that we get the, the same behavior that we saw before, even though we're using my thread pool. It's behaving in a very similar fashion. I've just we just implemented our own sort of new thread pool. Now, if you were to look at the real .NET thread pool, it's a whole lot more code than the, what is this, uh, 15 lines or 20 lines here. Almost all of the real code goes into two things. One, making it super efficient. And two, uh, not having a fixed number of threads. A lot of the logic is about thread management and increasing and decreasing the number of threads that the thread pool has over time in order to try and maintain good throughput for your application. But as I said, I'm not worrying about perf, so I'm sort of right. Sure. But one of the interesting things here, though, because we're in implementing this sort of at this lower level, is there are other things that we need to think about that uh, most developers implementing most library, implementing most code don't need to think about. But because we're implementing the details here, we do. And in particular, if you're familiar with, say, like ASP.NET, right? ASP.NET has this thing called HTTP context. Um, and you're able to use this HTTP context accessor to kind of basically say, give me the current HTTP context for where I am. Or uh, if you're using uh, like uh, principles with threads and you say, who is the current principle associated with this thread? That information somehow flows when you queue work items or you do other things. Uh, there's all this sort of ambient state that somehow seems to be able to magically flow from one from one thread where you're doing something to the continuation or to the other work that you've queued. Okay. Um, and that has to happen somehow, and it happens via something called execution context. So in lines four through 18 here, we have that captured value i. Does that then join thread local storage and kind of go along for the ride as, as you queue that, that work item? It's, it's not exactly what we would call thread local storage. So this value here is really just being stored onto an object that's being passed into queues or work item. Um, if thread local storage would be if I actually had a static 
uh, a static field and I tag it as thread static, okay. what that then ends up doing is saying that each thread has its own copy of that static field. Um, but with something like async and await or queues or work item, I'm going to be hopping between threads. So if I put something in thread local storage on one thread, it may or may not end up being available in the work that I queued because it might run on a different thread. So what we need is a mechanism to say that ambient state that we kind of have hanging out there, like in thread local storage, how do I enable that to automatically flow with my work? Because in the case of something like async await, I do A and then I await something and then I do B and I await something. I kind of like that ambient information to be present even across right. all of those possible hops. Think about so, it like if you were if you were building a large distributed system, maybe like a correlation ID that's allowing mm -hmm. you to go and, and track the logical transaction over the course of a large distributed system. And In the early days of ASP.NET, a lot of people got nailed by marking things as thread static. And then a thread gets reused in the pool and then someone else's account number is there. And like, wait a second, that variable is not my data. Exactly. And you, you, mentioned, you mentioned, you know, for distribution or tracing or whatnot, um, it's, that's a good, another good example where we take advantage of this, the activity stuff that's used for doing sort of distributed tracing. And you have, you can await any number of times, yet somehow your correlation ID or your, your IDs for your, your spans end up being the same. And that is via this mechanism. So there's a type in .NET called async local. Um, and I'll just call this uh, I. And then oh, I don't want I. Let's see. Uh, let's call this um, my value. Uh, and then here I can say my value dot value equals I. And I can use my value dot value here. So this looks like I have a single shared thing, right? It's sort of the same as the initial problem I had. It's it's shared. It's outside of my loop, uh, and I'm just storing a value into it, and I'm using that value here. Uh, but if I run this, we'll see that it correctly does what I wanted it to do, right? I've still got my incrementing numbers, and I'm not somehow sharing the same value across all these. That magic is happening via something called execution context in .NET, which is this thing that takes all of that thread local state that has been specifically put there and flows it with all of these asynchronous operations like queues or work item or new thread or await or task.run or any of these things. Now, normally that all just happens for you, right? That magic is happening for you by queues or work item or by task.run. But if I switch this over to my thread pool, and now I run this, it's mm. all zeros. Because right. we're, we're re-implementing that lower level of the stack. We need to handle that in that flow. So, so async local is this kind of multiverse friendly interdimensional traveler that's gonna like, okay, we're gonna start hopping around from thread to thread, and it's gonna be passed in as a parameter to this function, and then any changes to that object are gonna be seen by the caller, but then if you assign a new value, it's not gonna be seen by the caller. Yeah, and we and this is where Seeing exactly how it works under the covers kind of helps clear up exactly how that flow happens. And it's one of right. the reasons I love learning about this stuff at the lower level because you kind of you, your mental model for this kind of locks in place. Excellent. So what is this actually doing? Well, rather than just storing an action, we need to also store that execution context, that thing that's getting passed around. And then here, rather than just adding the action, I'm going to add execution context capture. So I'm going to grab the current context and store it along with this action in this collection. And then when I take this out, I'll just take out that execution context as well. So now I've not just, I've not only dequeued the action, but the execution context associated with it. Did you have a question? Okay. So action is a delegate. So I get yeah. that. Ac yeah. Uppercase A action is a, effectively a delegate. Yeah. Execution context seems to be like a very friendly and convenient thing that you just happen to have available to you in the base class library. What is its underlying data structure? If you were to use something a little bit lower level than even the fact that you could just say execution context. Execution context is basically just a dictionary of key value pairs yeah. that is stored in thread local storage. Um, it's a little bit more fancy than that, but it's really just what it is and everything else is kind of an optimization. And then it provides these APIs to say capture it, which just means grab the current one. And then 
what we'll see now is we need to be able to actually use it. So we, we kind of captured the context that was present when we queued the work item. And now we need to actually use that same context and kind of restore it temporarily while we invoke this delegate. Now it is possible that it's null because it's possible to suppress execution context flow. That's not really relevant for our discussion, but if it is null, I'm just gonna invoke the delegate and not worry about it. Otherwise, oh look, GitHub Copilot wrote it for me. Otherwise, uh, I'm gonna take this context and run the delegate that I'm passing in using that context. Uh, and so now, I previously got all zeros. Now when I run this, uh, we'll see that again, we kind of get that behavior that we wanted because now that ambient state is flowing from where the work item was queued to the invocation of that work item. Let's, let's scroll down and let's just spend a moment uh, looking at line uh, 36 just a little more deeply for those that may have seen that fly by because you're casting that state to action. Let's just make sure we understand what's happening there on that, on that so line. This is the line that GitHub Copilot wrote for me. And if I was yeah. writing this on my own, that's what I would have written as well. It okay. might be a little bit clearer if I, for our purposes here, if I write it a little bit less efficiently. Uh, and that is if I run it instead, like write it instead like this. Oh, not context. Work on it. Uh, these are functionally the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying invoke this delegate, which is just going to invoke this work item, with this context set basically as current. You know, have, it, have it restored. And then it's going to undo it afterwards. Right. The difference between these lines is execution context.run actually takes a state argument. And then that state argument is passed into that context callback delegate. So that delegate is just an action of object, basically just with a different name. So you can pass state into it. Um, in fact, if I, I should be able to browse to the definition here. And if I look at context callback, all you can see, you can see it's just a delegate that takes a state object. This was introduced before the action and action of object were added. So it's a, you know, a dedicated delegate type. If we were doing it again today, this type wouldn't exist. It would just be action of object. Right. And then just go back to program.cs. Sometimes, for those who may not be familiar, when you see something like state show up, you see context, which is uh, uh, which might you might think, oh, that's a that's a variable. It is in this case. But then state, it's a named parameter. Exactly. This is, easy, this it, is can a easy, it can be easy for a 200 level person to kind of go state. Well, what's state? Where'd that get declared? Yeah, so I can expand that a little bit. This right. is just uh, the the argument to this function, and so basically this state, this this R object here mm -hmm. is then being passed to execution context run, which will invoke this delegate, passing that object in as the state. And the reason I said this is for efficiency is because this version has what's called a closure, and it, it needs to reference this work item that's defined out here. So there's actually multiple objects being allocated here to be able to capture that work item into some object and create right. a delegate that's then passed in. And here I can avoid that. In fact, I can see that it's being avoided and that there's no closure by using the static keyword in C sharp. Mm -hmm. If I were to do anything in this delegate that tried to use state out here, like if I were to try and do this, the compiler is gonna warn me or give me an error and say, you can't do that. You're capturing state and you told me via this static keyword to not let that happen. So I'm yeah. not letting that happen. Yeah. So control Z us back to glory just a moment ago. And I also <laughs> want to call out, there's two fun things going on here. One from C sharp uh, eight, which is the, they call it the damn it operator. Yes. The, that null forgiving was a state. And I mean it, make that and talk about that for just very briefly. And then of course you've got object with yep. a question mark because that, yeah, there's, so these, there's no these... work happening here. Yeah. So the nullable reference type support in C sharp is quite nice. It's not perfect. There are some APIs where you just kind of can't fully express from an API definition perspective what you want to express. And in this case, what I really want to be able to say is I want to be able to pass in something here that is null, something that's not null. Uh, and I would like that to then impact whether this is nullable or non-nullable. If I pass something here that's non-null, I kind of like it to be this. And if I pass in something here that is null, I kind of like it to be that. Because this question mark means, can this be null or not? 
And you can do exactly that with generics. This API was introduced before there were generics. And so there's only one thing that this can possibly be, and it has to be able to work with nullable or non-nullable things that are passed in here. And as a result, the only thing that can be is the thing that can possibly be null, because something that is non-null or maybe null can both be maybe null. Um, in my case, I know it's non-null because I'm only in this code if work item, sorry, if um, if work item is non-null, and therefore I say that warning that you would otherwise give me by trying to use this thing that might be null, I know it's fine. I know better. I know, I better, know better than the compiler. One of the few times when we know better than the compiler. Hence the damn it operator, actually the null suppression <laughs> operator. <laughs> Well, no forgiving, I think, is what we know. No, yeah, no forgiving. That's uh, yeah, exactly. Cool. So that's what all I right. Was. So this is starting to this is starting to take shape here. Yeah. So we've got our thread pool, but Q user work item is pretty low level, right? It, it, Q work we can fork, but we're not really joining with it. And because of that, I've got this console read line here to kind of prevent my program from exiting. I'd really like to be able to both queue the work and then have some object that represents that work that I can later say, wait for this thing join with it, right? And for that in .NET, we have a class called task. So I'm going to implement my task. And we're going to implement our, you know, again, a very simple version of task that can then layer on top of my thread pool. Um, so there are a few things that we would want to do with this task. Task is just, at its core, it's just a data structure that sits in memory that you can do a few operations on. Um, one of the things that you can do is check whether it's completed. So I'm going to have a little bool is completed property here. And I'm just going to kind of scaffold this out and we'll we'll fill it in in a moment. Um, we also need to be walk up to that task and say, well, you know, I can check whether you're completed, but I want to be able to mark you as completed, basically say that you're you're done. And for that, I'm going to add two methods. I'm going to add a set result, set completed, whatever you want to call it. And also it might it might be representing an operation that has failed. So I want to have a uh, set exception. You saw again GitHub Copilot there automatically completing the line for me, which is quite nice. Um, now in the real .NET, uh, these are separated out onto a separate type called task completion source. That's not a functional thing. That's purely so that I can give you a task and not be worried that you're going to complete it out from under me. So I'm kind of reserving the capability to mark this task as having been completed. Um, for our purposes, I'm just putting it right on to, to task. And then I also want to be able to wait for one of these things. So we were just talking about being able to join with it. So I want to be able to say, you know, wait for this task to complete. Or if I don't want to synchronously block, maybe I want a callback. Maybe I want a notification that the task is completed. I want to be able to walk up to it at any point, whether it's completed or not, and give it a delegate that it will invoke when it completes. And for that, we're going to write a method called continue with that again, we'll just have take an action. Uh, which it will call when it's done. So this is the surface area of our task we're going to implement. And yeah, and uh, this is this is why I just love them. One of the best and most fun parts, and the hardest parts of computer science, of course, is naming stuff. And uh, I'm sure you've probably been in in, in meetings with with uh, partners and friends saying, "Let's get a thesaurus and find the word." And when you find the word, it's got the right mouth feel. You're like, "Okay, that's what it is." So like a task is an action, but it has a, it has other actions. So a task can have actions like has a is a you know all of those kind of things. But when you started writing task, I'm thinking to myself, well, gosh, an action's kind of a task. But no, tasks, they have more things. They have more context. They need to be a little different. Like yeah, it's, not, it's not only sort of you know representing some operation, but also then interacting with that operation in, in some way. Yeah. Um, so we can start filling this in. And it, again, it kind of writes itself. So is completed. All right, well, I need to track whether my task has com completed or not. So I need... Uh, this completed field. And we see that I can set an exception. So I probably need to be able to store a, an exception onto here. Again, uh, we can we can see that um, the, the question mark, because I may not have an exception. I may have an exception. So this is nullable. Uh, we can see here, you can walk up to this task at any time and give it an action to that it's going to invoke when it completes. I need to be able to store that somewhere. So we're going to have action uh, continuation. And then as we just saw with the thread pool, not only do I want to store that action, but I also want to be able to take that execution context that was sort of floating out there and capture it and restore it uh, uh, when I invoke this thing. So I'm also going to have an execution context. 
And now we can start filling in our method. So let's do is completed first. This is the easiest one. Uh, I'm going to say get, and then I want to return completed. Now, I do need to do a little bit of synchronization here because this task object is sort of, uh, uh, it needs to be implicitly thread safe because something over here is going to be completing it. Something over here is going to be joining with it. The real task in .NET does a, has a whole lot of code to try and make this synchronization as cheap as possible with lock-free operations and whatnot. I'm going to do a really simple thing that I don't recommend anyone else do in you know, a general case. And I'm just going to say lock this and just nope. protect all of my operations <laughs> with a big hog and lock. Everybody get in line behind this guy. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, but with that, this, this method has been implemented. Um, and again, it's what's kind of neat is you kind of look at your state. And I love the syntax highlighting in VS because it kind of shows me what I've used and what I still haven't used yet. The things that are grayed out are things that I haven't kind of used yet. And th in that way, it's kind of guiding what I do. Um, so both set result and set exception actually need to do the exact same thing. So I'm just going to implement them in terms of a single helper uh, that optionally takes an exception. And so then I can go up here and make this just call complete with null. And again, GitHub Copilot knows what I want to do and writes it for me. Um, and now I just need to implement this complete method. So this is uh, the operation has completed. This task is being used to represent that operation. So the code needs to come along and mark the task as having been complete. So again, big honk and lock. Uh, and you, it doesn't make sense to complete one of these twice. So we'll just say, if it's already completed, throw an exception, stop messing up my code. And then we can now proceed to actually implement this. So I need to mark it as completed. Right? That's pretty obvious. And I need to store the exception uh, that I was given. Uh, and now um, I'm almost done. But we can again see, if we look at our state, right? I've, I've set is completed. I've set exception. But we said that this continuation was meant to be invoked when the operation completed. So now I can say if continuation, I can type it, if continuation uh, is not null, and again, it tried to write it for me, which is pretty cool, then I want to queue a work item that invokes the continuation. Now, this isn't 100% correct, uh, and it's a good reminder that while something like GitHub Copilot can help you write most of the code, you still want to check to make sure that it wrote what you wanted it to. This is functionally correct, except it's missing using this context. Yep. So I'm just going to go up here and again, uh, do exactly what we saw before, which was if context is null, then just invoke the continuation. Otherwise, do that whole execution context, oops, execution context dot run thing. It does thing. feel like there should be a way to say all of that in one line, though. Yeah, maybe we should add an overload of run that, you know, does the right thing, just doesn't. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so uh, complete is now, now complete. Um, uh, so we've implemented is completed, we've implemented set result, we've implemented set exception. Uh, let's do continue with next. This one was also pretty simple. Uh, so we'll just lock around you know, ourselves. Um, and now we can say if we're already completed, well, we can just queue the work item that the user asked us to invoke. We don't have to do uh, anything, anything special. Um, I'll just do this and else. Otherwise, we're just going to store that for later. And then we also need to uh, capture the context for use. And that's that's continue with, right? So now we've hooked up this delegate, and all we're doing is saying if the task is already done, and run this now by queuing it. If it's not done, store it such that when it is completed, this code over here can then launch this. In, in, the, in this, in this the, I don't know if the word naive implementation, in this simplified implementation, yep. is it, how bad is it? I just want to make sure, how bad is it that you're locking on this? Like, is that a reasonable thing to do because we are creating a low level component? Like as a general rule, application developers should not be locking on this because they don't know who else is locking on the thing. But is it less of a sin that you're doing it? So there's two aspects to your question here. One is, using locks in general, and the other is locking on this. Yeah, I'm speaking specifically about lock this, which so, I was like taught and ingrained to, to never do. Don't do that, right, yeah. So the concern is, it, like I would, if this was actually task, you would definitely not want to do this. And the reason you don't want to do it is it's, 
this the lock that you that you is basically an implementation detail. It's private state, mm -hmm. and yet this the reference to the object is public. So it would be akin to having, you know, it would be exactly the same as having a uh, my lock object, but then choosing to make this public, right? Because so anyone, anyone else, else could lock on it. And now you're having this weird interaction with code that you didn't expect to be touching your private state. And so that's really what it's about. If you know that no one else is going to be, that no one else except you will have a reference to your object, you could lock on this. Ah, I got it. So we are a public cl class. My task is a, 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 a public class, but well, actually not a public class. Pardon me. It's not, no one will ever have a handle to us. So there's no way, way for anyone to ever lock on us is what you're saying. Right. Ah, that's good. That's good information. Um, yeah. So then I didn't leave any of those lying around, did I? I don't think so. Okay. Um, so our last method, the only thing we have left to implement is this wait, because I want to be able to, for at least, especially for demo purposes, walk up to the task and say, let's make the fonts just a smidge bigger. Oh, sorry. I know I that you're, wait. I want to point out how, how, how talented you are in your zooming, your control scrolling is very good. But <laughs> I'm actually you. watching your brain as you're like, I'm getting increased scope and I'm reducing scope. <laughs> and I'm, you know, you're, you're using the zoom yourself, not just as a presenter, but also as a way of scoping the space that you know that this work will take up. Uh, I want to be thoughtful for our friends on their phones and on their iPads too. Apologies to them. Yeah, sorry. Um, so now we want to be able to wait for this task, to just walk up to the task and synchronously block. And what's fun about this one is we can actually implement this in terms of continuous. And this isn't just some novelty that I'm going to do here. This is actually how task.wait is implemented. It's also implemented in terms of continuations. So I need to be able to block. And anytime you want to kind of synchronously block waiting for something, you need some sort of synchronization primitive. In this case, I'm going to use a manual reset event. Uh, and I'm going to, again, lock. And I'm going to say, if we're not completed, I, I need to do something. And I'm, I'm purposefully ignoring what GitHub Copilot is telling me to do here because it's right, but it's also uh, making it hard for me to be sort of pedagogical <laughs> and teach because it's jumping way ahead. Um, so I'm going to wait for this manual reset event, but only if I create one. And so I'm only going to create one if this task hasn't yet completed. If it's already completed, I don't have. There's nothing for me to wait for. So if it hasn't completed, then I actually instantiate this. And now I need to signal this manual reset event to become in a signaled state, such that anyone will waiting on it will wake up when this task completes. How do I do that? I can say continue with manual reset event dot set. So now I'm implementing wait in terms of continue with by saying, when this task completes, hook up a delegate that will invoke manual reset event slim dot set, which will then cause this to wake up. And manual and reset event slim is literally the slim lighter weight version of manual reset event. And because you're not going to be waiting long, it would be appropriate to use the the light the the it's, diet it, coke version of manual. It's actually reset. appropriate to use the diet coke version in ninety nine percent of situations uh, and better to use the Diet Coke version, even though I know my, you know, my wife tells me that I shouldn't be drinking Diet Coke. I know but, my wife um, says the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in this case, the manual reset event is just a very thin wrapper around the OS's, the kernel's uh, equivalent uh, primitive. And that means that every time I do any operation on it, I'm, I'm kind of paying a fair amount of overhead to dive down into the kernel. Manual reset event slim is a much lighter weight version of it that's all implemented up in user code in .NET world, um, basically just in terms of uh, monitors, which is what lock is also built on top of. Um, the only time it's less appropriate to use it is if you actually need one of those kernel level things, which you typically only need if you're doing something more esoteric with weight handles in, in a broader. Yeah, so anyhow. Totally good here. The last thing I need to do, though, is um, we can see, and I mentioned using the, the grayness of my fields to know whether I was done or not. Um, obviously, this one is still grayed out. I'm, I'm missing something. It's, this, is, this grayness is saying that it's I said it, but I've never actually read it. And that's because 
you know, when I wait on this thing, I actually want whatever exception was there to propagate out and I haven't read it yet. So now that I know this is done, I'll just say uh, if exception is not null, and again, I'm gonna ignore GitHub Copilot even though it's, it's right. Um, I basically want to throw this exception so it propagates out. Now, this isn't ideal either. Um, if you have an existing exception object that has previously been thrown, that exception contains a stack trace, it contains some uh, what's referred to as the Watson bucket, which uh, contains sort of aggregatable information about where that exception came from for use in um, post-mortem debugging and diagnostics. Um, when I throw exception like I'm doing right there, that's going to overwrite all of that information. So right. I kind of don't want to do that. Um, one common way around that, uh, and that was the only way around that when task initially hit the scene and done it framework 4.0 was to wrap it in another exception. So you might wrap this in uh, and have like an inner exception. Exactly. And so you can see exception has an inner exception and now throwing this will populate this exception stack trace. This exception will still be available as the inner exception and it won't be touched. So all of the stack trace will stay in place. And then so we're not doing a, just a throw because we're not in the middle of an actual active exception that we have just previously previously caught in our rethrowing. Exactly. Yep. Um, now, so task basically had to do this. While it was doing that, it also factored in the fact, well, a task could represent multiple operations that were sort of all part of the same overall operation. Like if you have task dot when all, uh, that will you can wait for multiple tasks and that produces a single sort of task result, which needs to be able to contain multiple exceptions. So task, instead of throwing regular exception, it throws an aggregate exception. Uh, and you can see from uh, constructors that are available that you can give this any number of exceptions and it can wrap any number of inner exceptions. That's what the params there means. Um, but here I'm only wrapping one. Now, since, uh, since task was introduced uh, and something that was very useful for await, is another sort of pretty low-level type called exception dispatch info. Oh, wow. The name doesn't really matter, but what this does is it takes that exception and it throws it, but rather than overwriting the current stack trace, it appends the current stack trace. And so for anyone who's looked at a, an exception that's propagated through multiple awaits, you might be used to seeing a bit of a stack trace and then it, a little dotted line that says, you know, uh, continued at or original throw location and then more stack trace. Every time this exception is getting rethrown up the call stack, up the asynchronous call stack, more state is being appended to that stack. And that's all handled via this. Um, so we've now implemented task and that's basically what it is. So I can go up here and I'll just say I have a list of my task and then Oh, actually, one more thing I want to do first. What I was going to say was I was going to have uh, tasks, and then here I was going to say add uh, my task dot run, and then I realized we haven't actually implemented my task dot run yet. So let's do that. Um, so, ooh, is this an opportunity for you to go over to that dot run and hit uh, you know control dot and see if it will, if Visual Studio will generate that run for you? I could try. What, what, what do you want me to do? Is it like a quick action? If you hit the little, if you hit the little uh, generate method run, will it do the right method? So it generated the method, uh, but without implementation. Yeah. Um, now, Copilot can actually start filling this in for me, but again, I kind of want the fun of doing it. So oh yeah, I'll, I'll I let, agree. I'll let it do the little things, uh, and uh, and, it, and it made assumptions as well. Of course, in that case, there Visual Studio made some assumptions about scoping and things like that. So internal, yep. so public static my task run action. Yep, which looks a lot like task dot run. Uh, now, in all of these little helpers, we'll see implemented. They all have a similar form. We're going to create a task, and we're going to return it. And then in the middle here, we're going to do something that does the operation and completes that task. Now, in the case of run, all that's doing is saying my thread pool queues or work item. Uh, we're going to have a try catch block that invokes this action. When it is successfully completed, we'll say t.set result. And if it failed with an exception, then we'll say t.set exception and we'll bail. And now we fully implemented task.run. And again, other than some minor perf differences, this is exactly what task.run actually does. Queues a work item, 
that completes the task when the delegate has been invoked. Right. And I think um, that chunk right there, that, that that's where it really crystallized for me from 105 to 118 right there. You've abstracted away that previous use of Q user work item, added a lot of value around the things you might want to do with a task, check on its completion and things like yep. that, set continuations, huge amount of value in a small amount of code. Absolutely. And this also speaks to the kind of the ubiquitous nature of task. One of the, the most important things that task does isn't even the operations on it. It's conceptually the fact that it unifies into a single type the ability to join with any arbitrary asynchronous operation in .NET. And that was a critical step for async and await because you want to be able to use await with any asynchronous operation. And by having a single type that can represent any of them, it makes that a whole lot more convenient. So this is the building block. This is the beginning of it. We've this got about 20 minutes to bring it home then. So let's yeah. understand how task then becomes such a powerful pattern. So that's, that's great. So I want to show two aspects of that. First, we can see now that my squigglies are gone. And here I could just say for each uh, t in tasks, t.wait. And mm -hmm. I'm going to lower this number because I don't want to wait for thousands of these to complete. Yeah. Uh, but now when I run this, where's my, oh, it's still building. Build. And let's let's try to zoom in on both our terminal and our code. As soon as it finishes here. Oh, is it on another? Is it um, thinking? No, there you go. You're over here. So um, when this gets to 100, we can see it hasn't exited. But the moment it gets to 100, then my application exits because it was waiting for all of those tasks to complete. Now, you mentioned, Scott, that we start to see kind of this being a building block and we can build other things on top of it. It's kind of unfortunate that I'm having to wait for each of these tasks yeah, individually. Yeah, you want to wait for all of them. Right. Wouldn't it be nice if I could say my task dot when all and just pass in all of these and then for the purposes of my demo, I'm just sure. going to block waiting for that thing. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'll, I'll use your little trick here and I'll say... You can hit control uh, dot, I think, as well. Control, oh, I was using the wrong one. Alt. Control dot, generate method when all. Uh, so this, we're going to have this return of my task. I also want this to be public. This is taking a list of tasks. So we're going to do the exact same thing we saw before. I'll say my task and return t. And now we, again, just need to fill in this intermediate part. I'm going to handle one base case, which is if, if the number of tasks is zero, then I'm just going to say, all right, I'm done. Nothing else for me to do, right? Otherwise, I need to loop through all of these tasks and hook up a continuation to each of these that will basically count down how many are left. And when all of them have completed, then it will set that task. So out here, I'm just going to create a little continuation that I'm going to reuse uh, for all of these tasks. I'm going to have a little counter, how many are left, tasks.count. And here I'll say if, uh, after decrementing remaining, I end up with zero, then I'm going to complete the task. Now I should also be doing some stuff with exceptions here. Not going to bother with that right now. It's kind of not the point. But now I can take this continuation. I can uh, put it here. Oh, I have something else named T. Sorry. Uh, task in tasks. Um, and now I've implemented when all. So if I go up here, I've got my little, my squiggly is gone. I can run this again, bring this window over. And again, now when I get to 100, uh, we should see this. All right. And then jump back to the implementation of that very briefly for me, sir. So I want to call out, you're using interlock.decrement instead of just saying remaining minus minus because? Because uh, I don't have no idea what these tasks are doing. They might all be completing at the same time or not. And if they were to both complete at approximately the same time, this continuation, two different threads might be trying to decrement this value. And if they each tried to do it without any synchronization, their operations might sort of stomp on each other, and we might lose some of the decrements, which would be a big problem because we wouldn't know when we actually hit zero. So and I'm then, using this lightweight synchronization mechanism to ensure that all of the decrements are tracked and that only the one that is actually the last one to complete performs this work. Because as we saw, if I dive into this, if multiple of them think that they're the last one and they try and both complete it, it's going to fail. Right. And you said lightweight synchronization method, as opposed to trying to do some locking around that, which I suppose you could have done. And totally could have. 
Uh, I could have had it taken a lock here, but this is one place where it's really simple and straightforward to use basically the lowest level synchronization primitive that I have available to me, which is uh, a lock-free interlocked operation. Very cool. Um, as long as I'm implementing other helpers, I can implement some more, and we'll see they all follow the same pattern. One of the most useful that people find with tasks is delay. So let's also implement that. So I can say delay, and we'll have some timeout here. And this is, again, going to follow the uh, exact same pattern we've seen before. So we'll say new task, and we'll return that task. And then here, I just need to do something that after this timeout has happened, will complete the task. Uh, I can use a timer for that. So I'll say new timer. When this timer completes, it's just going to set result. And then I'm going to schedule the timer to complete in this number of milliseconds. So why is that more appropriate than what a what, what, what someone who may be trying to use do this exercise themselves might naively say, oh, thread.sleep? That's a great question. Thread.sleep takes the thread and puts it to sleep uh, for the specified amount of time. So if I had 12 threads in my thread pool and someone read, wrote thread.sleep 1000 as part of their work item, now all of the threads in my thread pool are unable to do anything else. And that means if someone comes in and queues something that's actually important, they're going to have to wait for all those threads to become available. Wouldn't it be nice if we could instead sort of still have my logical flow of control pause its logical flow of control for this period of time, but allow that thread to do something else while that's happening? And that's the beauty of await task.delay. So we can, we can see that sort of in practice now that we have our delay. I'm just going to go and delete. Or I'll comment out all this up here, and I'll just do something simple like console write uh, write hello, and then I'll say my task dot delay. Um, let's say two thousand, and then after that delay, I'm going to use our new our new continuous method to now print out console dot write world. Right? And uh, again, I'll have our console.read line here to make sure our program doesn't exit because we're spawning this asynchronous work, but we're, we're not currently joining with it. Uh, and so now when I run this, uh, my window pops up, we get hello, and then two seconds later, we get world. Um, but I would kind of like to be able to just say wait here rather than having that console. Dot, uh, the console.read line. But we can see we're getting a squiggle here saying continue with returns void. Well, we can fix that exactly the same way that we've seen in our other methods. I'm just going to say my task, new task, down here, I'll return it. Uh, and I just need to do something slightly different than queuing this action. Rather than queuing that action, I want to have uh, a different, uh, let's just call this callback. And what this callback is going to do is invoke action and then call t.setResult. Now we're going to do the same dance here just to be good citizens that we saw before. We'll catch exception. Uh, we'll set the exception onto this task. Uh, and so if this action were to fail, um, we will still end up completing this task. And now I can just take this callback and use it instead of uh, use it instead of the original action that was passed in. Uh, and now when I go up here, we'll see that I, my, I no longer have a squiggly. And I'm going to make this a little bit longer just because I keep having to move my, I can't figure out how to get my window to start over here. So uh, we get our hello. And then once the world appears, um, that's when the program nice. exits. Hello, uh, pause for effect, world. Exactly. Um, kind of like an LLM, right? You're spitting out these little tokens as you're waiting for each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, it would be nice if I could sort of not just do one thing after a delay, but it'd be kind of cool if I could just take this and say, after another two seconds, I right. want to print out. Uh, well, like, and like the LLMs, chain them exactly. and just have them go, chain. hello, hello, hello. Exactly, chain yeah, these yeah, things yeah. together. And then maybe I want to do that again in here. Uh, I'll say, uh, how are you, right? But we can see I'm getting a squiggly because I'm trying to return a task out of something that was just accepting an action. You were, we were talking about the delegate earlier, and the action delegate is just void returning. Um, moreover, even if that worked, I want this wait to not only wait for this work that has completed, but also for any task that it's sort of returning out of its body. 
Um, so I need a slightly different version of continue with that's able to sort of unwrap that inner task. Uh, continue with here, I'm going to just copy and paste this whole thing and create a slightly different version of it. We already talked about action. Uh, I'm just going to take a, another version of it that not only invokes this action, but this action is then going to return another task. And we don't want to return the task that's completed from here until this task has completed. So I'm just going to store that next. Take this result out of here because we don't want to complete when this outer one has completed, only when the inner one has. And then I'm just going to hook up a continuation to this. So I'll say uh, when this task completes. Kind of a linked list had, of actions here. Sorry, say that again? Oh, just kind of a linked list of actions. Just like what exactly. is the next one in the, in the, in the tree? So here I'll just say set exception with that exception. Otherwise, yep. we'll say set result. And I don't need to change anything else. Now my squiggles have gone away. And with any luck, when I run this, we'll see hello, world, and Scott, how are you? And we don't exit until that whole chain has completed. Nice. Um, this is a pretty unfortunate it's, way to have to write. <laughs> yeah, zoom zoom in a little bit there. It looks a little weird. I mean, like it it it's kind of like you know they, what they called it arrow code in the old days, where exactly. And and we can fix that to some extent. We could go in here and we could delete this. And then here I could say continue with because of that because I've already implemented. Yeah, uh, but that's an know. aesthetic at this point. Like it's, it's it... right. So I could run this and it would do the right thing. But I have this very linear mm. continue with continue with continue with. If I wanted to instead do something like for i equals zero, i is less than or forget even that part, just this, and I wanted to print out forever. The, yeah, for the current i, but I still wanted to have that my yeah. task got delay in here. A nice delay. I, I don't, what do I do, right? I, I, this won't work because right. I'm not going to be waiting at all. I don't want to use thread.sleep. This is where if I had something called await, I, I kind of want it to, to kick in here, but I don't. Interestingly, there is something that almost serves that exact purpose that we've had since C Sharp 2.0, mm -hmm. and that is async iterators. So if I were to instead have code that did this. Uh, if I had uh, I, uh, I enumerable of int, uh, call it count, it's just got uh, or I equals zero, I is less than count, I plus plus. Here I can yield yeah. out of here. And somehow I'm able to magically come back in. So if out here I were to say for each int I and count, count 10. Oops. All right. And, uh, and that uh, yield is just kind of like, hey, here's the next one. We're going to keep returning, keep returning. It's just yields of not used enough and not well understood keyword. And one of the great ways to understand it, if I just debug into this and I start stepping through this, I call count. I didn't actually step into count yet Yeah. until I move next. And then when I step, we can see I end up back in this method. Yeah. And it's restoring the state each time I step, right. it's remembering that state from this previous operation. Wouldn't it be nice if I could do that exact same thing, except instead of yields returning out I, ah, okay. I so yield yield in this task. case is rehydrating the state. In this case, the state is simply I. You're exactly. going to rehydrate the entire execution context. So what I'd kind of like to do is to have this code, but have this in a method. Let's call it... Uh, Forget what this is actually returning for a sec. Let's just call it print async. And I want to sort of yield return out this task from this. And rather than kind of manually pushing it forward, calling move next on that I enumerator, what I want to have happen is when this task is yielded and this task completes, I want its completion to call move next. I want it to sort of drive itself. So we can implement that. And actually, we can implement it pretty easily. Let's go down to where I was writing all these helpers. And we're going to write one very last helper. I'm going to call this iterate. This is going to take an enumerable of task. We're going to do the exact same thing we saw before. Return that out. And uh, if you're familiar with enumerators, 
the main thing on an enumerator that moves it forward is a move next method. So we want a move next method here. I also want to invoke it to sort of kick things off. Uh, I need to get the enumerator of my task out from here. So we'll say tasks.getEnumerator. And now we just need to implement this little bit of code that says move the state machine forward, move next, get the task that was returned, and when it completes, move it forward again. So I'll say if e.moveNext, if we were able to get another one, and we'll fill that in in just a moment, if I wasn't able to get another one, well, I'm done. There's nothing, nothing more for me to do. And again, for good measure, we can wrap this with a catch block that will set the exception. And now all I have to do is this little bit of code here. What is this gonna do? Well, we're gonna say, what is the next task? It's whatever was yielded. And we're gonna take that and say, continue with move next. And now, when I call iterate with this lazily produced iterator of tasks, we're going to start it off. We're going to enter the method calling move next, which will push the iterator forward, which will start running my the code in my iterator. Eventually, we'll yield return a task. We'll get that out. We'll hook up a continuation and we'll exit. When that continuation runs, it will call move next. It'll push it forward and so on and so on. Eventually, there won't be anything else to yield. My iterator will have reached its end and we'll call set result. So if I go up here, and now I can just say my task dot iterate print async. And if I run this, we'll see we're getting yeah, we're getting running nice this. We're, we're yielding yeah, out these tasks. Yeah. yeah, and we're getting that delay. And we've been able to do it with just this little helper. And believe it or not, that little helper is basically what the compiler generates for async await. We've effectively implemented async await here. Uh, in fact, in the, in the C Sharp compiler, the logic to support implementing iterators and the logic to support implementing async methods, it's like 90% the same. There are a few differences here and there, but for the most part, it's implementing a state machine that allows it to be uh, exited and re-entered and rehydrated and come back to where you were. And the real thing that differs is who is calling move next? Is it the, the developer's code with for each calling uh, enumerator dot move next, or is it the completion of the the awaited task, or the, in this case, the yield returned task, calling continue with with a move next that will that will feed back into it? Um, we can take this you know further. I can show kind of full circle how this uh, we can actually um, you know replace this with await by implementing a little awaiter on this, and how we can replace this with async my task by implementing an async method builder. But at the end of the day, it's just some syntactic sugar uh, that's allowing the C-sharp compiler to use our custom task. We really have implemented async await from scratch. I love that word syntactic sugar because I think people don't realize that like each little additional layer of abstraction is, is indistinguishable from magic. And if we accept those little abstractions as being black boxes, then we are uh, going to struggle. But if you realize that, like when you went and made that iterate function, go back down there. There's, there's you just buried it, you hid it, but it's so clean and small. And now you have a nice helper function, and but you can go and look at that. You can go and see that. You can see what the compiler generates. You're not helpless. Exactly. And I know you have to run, but just for to exemplify that. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to, for now, we're going to pretend that task exists again, and I'm going to make this await. Await is just the compiler saying like, hey, I want to hook up a, continue with, a continuation. Tell me how to hook up a continuation to your thing. It knows how to do it for task. It doesn't know how to do it for my task. But in just a few lines of code, we can make that keyword work for our task. So I can just write a little struct here called awaiter that's going to accept uh, a task. Uh, here I'm using uh, primary constructors. I just have to implement a little bit of code. I say I notify completion uh, and implement that interface. We're not going to, you know what, I'll just have the, let's just let the GitHub Copilot write it all since I know you're stressed for time. Um, so we're just going to uh, fix up a few things here. And we can now, with one more line, get a waiter, do this. And if, uh, 
Oh, this needs to be public. Yeah, it's, uh, public. Uh, public. Um, you notice this squiggly has gone away. We're now yeah. able to await our custom task as part of uh, this loop. And again, we see the exact same thing, but using the actual async yeah, await. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just swap. So just like you swapped uh, from task to my task, then you can swap from a waiter to a wait, and you're really showcasing that the, the the core functionality is the same. Exactly. And if we had a few more minutes, we could do the exact same thing, and I could make this say my task, but I won't keep you from your son. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, this has been incredibly helpful. I hope that the other folks uh, who are watching have enjoyed this as much as I have. That's a, that's basically 70 minutes, just a little bit over an hour to understand that fundamental concept behind await and async how it works, why it works, and then a good reminder to us all that you can see that. You can dig in if you choose to. I want to encourage folks, though, who may be application developers who might think, like, why do I need to know this? A reminder that I tell myself is I pick the layer that I understand truly, and I go one layer below to get a little bit uncomfortable. I don't think, Stephen, you're telling us that we all need to drive stick shift. We all need to have a kit car in the garage that we built from scratch. Not if you all. want to build a toaster, you don't have to smelt your own iron. But it's fun to just look underneath the hood and go, huh, I use that every day. Now I know. And and by doing so, you build a, a better sense for how it works, and then you can use it better, even if you never have to write that code ever. Exactly. Fantastic. All right. Well, I think this has been super fun. I'd love to have you and some of your engineering friends on uh, to chat with us again sometime. So we'll do That's that fun. soon. Always happy to chat.